anyway, uh, we'll leave that uh, aside to talk about something that doesn't have anything uh, to do with COVID because you're probably aware uh, that... Um, because it has been, it was reported here, it was reported uh, widespread, and it's been over, so, uh, all over social media that our movies and booze contributor and great friend, uh, Tomas Clancy, uh, died uh, on Monday, and uh, he had had uh, health issues uh, for quite a while. Um, it seemed like he was out of the woods and then he kind of things took a step back and then it seemed like he was out of the woods again and then things took a, a, a step back. Now, as I say, it had been going on for a while, but Tomas was the sort of fella uh, who wouldn't tell you about it. And that's why I'm being vague. He'd want me to be vague. Uh, he, you know, he wasn't the sort of fella who would go boo-hoo, I'm ill and, and uh, give you the details. Uh, what he was focused on, what he was always focused on uh, was getting back uh, healthy again and getting back to do and uh, doing the things he loved and obviously if you ever listen to him uh, on this show um, he absolutely adored uh, coming in here and it was one of the things uh, he absolutely adored doing as you know probably he, he wrote for many many years uh, for the business post as well uh, about wine and you know again when you heard him on the show, he didn't just talk about the wine. He was kind of like Paolo Tullio in that way. It wasn't just about the wine. It was about the people and the place it came from and the geopolitics and the terrain and the climate and the history. And somehow all those things uh, connected up with each other. And when he finished telling you about where this wine came from, you wanted to be in that place. You wanted to see all the people he described rather than just drink uh, a glass of that wine and that approach he, he took I suppose is kind of also reflective in his background because he, he didn't do wine uh, full time he he was a barrister and he was uh, he was a law lecturer as well many people over the last couple of days have uh, been getting in contact uh, saying how much they enjoyed him as a teacher as well uh, and more lately when you know he'd had the health issues he took he, that took something of a back then he started doing a doctorate then he was doing a doctorate in copyright law uh, in publishing in Dublin I think in the 1800s which was again absolutely fascinating and we had planned when he was finished to bring him in and do a long interview about that but there was a period in history where you could there was no copyright law here so any book could be published be uh, be published here uh, and that's because he was you know he 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 wasn't restricted by what he did uh, before he, he trained as a barrister. While he was training as a barrister, uh, he was also a journalist. He was the rock correspondent for In Dublin uh, magazine. He also, along with his brother, promoted gigs. He promoted music gigs. Um, and he knew about every conceivable sort of music uh, that you can imagine. And not even... Now, he, looked, he knew about opera, he knew about classical music, uh, he knew about rock music, but he wasn't even limited by his age, as kind of a lot of people are. There's usually a cut-off point that they know about all the bands up to, you know, 1986 or something. But, you know, Tomas knew, you know, was a big, big fan of hip-hop. Um, and, but there was always a Tomasi way of doing things because I can remember what one night late we were having this conversation about what was the first gig you were ever at that you remember? And uh, mine was I saw Graham Parker in The Rumour and Chuck Furbo in, in Galway, which he got very excited about because there's huge family connections down in that part of the country. And um, it's not there anymore now. It's called the Connemara Coast Hotel. But uh, uh, And Tomás was very excited. Said, that was great. Oh, my God, what a brilliant first gig. And then he was reluctant to even tell me what his first gig was. Uh, and eventually I wheedled out of him. He went to Paris to see Tom Waits, uh, which you couldn't. Uh, and that was only because the sort of fellow he was, that he always wanted you to leave a conversation feeling good about yourself, despite the fact uh, he was invariably the uh, the smartest guy in in the room and his breadth of knowledge on absolutely uh, everything on books and art and politics and music uh, and he was a huge Star Wars fan uh, on top of all that but I, to be honest with you though the most uh, the thing I remember about him and I, and I think that the thing that most people here will remember about him was the sweetness of his nature uh, I don't know anyone who was had never been charmed by him I never heard him say a bad word about anyone and not in a kind of acute or political way. He just didn't have a mean bone in his body. Uh, he really was a beautiful man and it was remarkable how everybody uh, over the last few days called him a gentleman. And he really was. He really was to, to his fingertips. And on Monday when we got, uh, when we got the, the news and it did ring Esther... Uh, to let her know because, you know, obviously she'd spent uh, so much time sitting in the studio with him and uh, 
she did say, uh, <laughs> she did say, you know, I, I love Tomas, but you really loved him. And uh, she said, I'd be in the studio witnessing your bromance. And, you know, that was when I started blubbing then. But uh, she was spot on. And, and as many people have remarked over the, you know, over the last f- uh, few days since since Monday, we've had a bit of loss, you know, on the show. Terry Dolan and Paolo Tulio and David Carey. And now to Maz Clancy, and you know that really would be a dinner party uh, you'd want to go to. Now, obviously, that loss is nothing uh, compared to that of his wife Claire and his sons Tomas and James. And if you spent two minutes in his company, you'd know how much he adored his family and his extended family uh, in Galway and Connemara, where he's being buried. And uh, it's a cemetery in the deep west, as he'd say himself. So um, he'll always have a view of the sea.